it's an absolute privilege and an honour to open God's Word and wonderful to hear as well um, what God has been doing here over the last year, over the last few weeks as I've heard the stories and, and just seeing what God's doing. And so let's thank Him. Let's bow our heads now and let's come before our holy God. God is as young Lord, has impressed on our hearts. There's no God like you. <laughs> There's no God like you. No one is faithful like you are. No one is compassionate like you. No one has been gracious to me like you have. So, oh God, we, we worship you, Lord, as we come to this book of Revelation, this most incredible part of your word. Lord, please speak to us. Lord, as we study this this year, Lord, just speak to us and transform our hearts, I pray, Lord. May you be seen in all your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Last year I <clears throat> watched a documentary. I sat up late one night and watched a documentary on CNN. And it was the kill and capture of Osama bin Laden. I don't know if you've seen it or if it aired in Australia, but it's kind of a fascinating documentary. And basically... It interviewed this one US Marine who was the guy who was responsible for killing Osama bin Laden. And so the documentary followed through about how they gathered the US Marines together. It was about 10 of highly trained US Marines together and they told them about the mission. But they didn't tell them everything about the mission. They just told them that it would be the biggest mission of their lives. And so they started their training and they set up a compound, a house which was going to be similar to the one that they were going into. And then a couple of days before the mission started, they told them what they were going to do. And that probably, it's very likely, that they wouldn't come back. So if you want to bail out now, now's your time. And so all of the men decided that they were wanting to give up their life for their country. They were willing to do it. So they wrote their wills and they said goodbye to their wives and their children. So they literally thought that they wouldn't be coming back. So they flew from the US to the base in Afghanistan, did some more planning, and then from Afghanistan, they took a 90-minute flight in two Black Hawk helicopters to the place where Osama bin Laden was supposed to be. Now, this Marine is fascinating. He described what that 90-minute flight was like. Basically, they were going into territory that they had no approval to be in. And so they were flying at low altitude, and he said he was sitting there with the reality that any moment in the blackness of the night, they could get blown out of the sky. You imagine what that would be like. And he said it was funny how different men in the helicopters dealt with it. He said there were some cracking jokes in the corner. Some were trying to get to sleep. But him, he was gripping onto his seat. And I think I would have been like that too. Anyway, the two Black Hawk helicopters, they arrive at the compound and they land. One actually crashed, but they all survived. And they piled out of the helicopters and they ran into the house and... One by one, these Marines started clearing out rooms. I suppose they, they go in and they secure a room and they go to the next one and secure that room. And so they, they went in and it has a three-level house. And so after 15 minutes, I think, they were in there. By the time they got to the second floor and there was a staircase that went up to the third floor. And by that time, it was just the leader of the group and this one US Marine. And they climbed up the steps, one by one, and as they got to the top, a, a bunch of women came running down the hallway, 
and the leader just dived on them because he thought they had explosive devices. And then it was just this one US Marine left. And he said that he took three steps down the hallway and he turned into the first doorway and there was the man that he'd been seeing on TV for 10 years from his little hometown in Montana and that everyone in the world wanted to see dead. Enemy number one. And all of that went through his mind and in a split second, Osama bin Laden was dead. And so it was this amazing feeling amongst the US Marines that Osama bin Laden's body was on the ground in front of them. After all that he had done on September 11, 2001, the enemy was dead. And so they took his body down outside in the compound. They're, they're getting ready and they started to, to laugh and joke and think, wow, this is, this is incredible. Osama bin Laden is dead. Imagine what the world is going to say about it. And then all of a sudden, it dawned on this US Marine, we've got 90 minutes to fly back to home base. Right now, we are living in those 90 minutes. You see, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came on a mission to overcome sin and Satan, and he completed the mission. He cried out on the cross, it is finished. And so there's no overturning that. It was in absolute terms. And yet sometimes as we face this world, we might wonder, where exactly is the victory? As we look around at this world, we think, where exactly is it? You see, yes, the enemy is defeated, Satan is destroyed, but we still have 90 minutes left to consummation. We still have 90 minutes, this life to live, this period of time to live until the exaltation of Christ takes place so that everyone can see it. And so sometimes as we experience this life and we look around and, and, and we experience it ourselves, we say to ourselves, where is the victory? Like today alone worldwide, there will be 125,000 abortions and millions of children will die and marriages are breaking and people are contemplating suicide and depression and drugs kill our youth and in 40 nations of our world, Christians are being persecuted. And so you think, where is the victory? I, I can't see the victory. In Hebrews 2 verse 8, it, it describes it. It says, at present, we do not see all things in subjection to him. That's how Hebrews describes it. Where is the victory? And this is exactly the question that was on the early Christian's mind at the end of the first century A.D., Open up your Bibles to Revelation 1 if you haven't got it there. This is exactly the question that they're thinking. Where is the victory? Because these Christians were under the oppression of Emperor Domitian. Domitian was a man who took the wives of many men. He left his own brother Titus for dead. He buried alive a woman who was caught with a lover. Early writings say that he was short and round with spindly little legs, a bald head with a large wart on top of it. And apparently he was so sensitive about his looks that he put to death the man that paid him out about it. Later on, he seduced his own niece, and then she died when he made her have an abortion. So Domitian was a moral catastrophe of a man. He demanded this, imagine this. Imagine a man like this, and imagine when you have to go into his presence. This is what he demanded that you say to him, my Lord and my God. <laughs> you imagine saying something like that to a man like him. And so you think, where's the victory? Here are the kings of the earth fattening themselves up with wine and immorality and the glory at expense of Christians. Where's the victory? Now, you have the complete opposite in the author of this book, the Apostle John. He's the disciple whom Jesus loved, 
the one that was chosen to take care, care of Mary at the foot of the cross. He's the author of the fourth gospel. He wrote first and second and third John. He's about to write Revelation. All the other disciples are martyred for the faith by this time, and John is the only one left forging ahead a, a ministry to the, to the churches of Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And they are under heavy persecution. And because of his ministry, John suffered. He was thrown into a boiling pot of oil. And somehow he survived that, and in verse 9 it tells us that he was exiled to the island of Patmos under heavy persecution. And so here is the, the island of Patmos today. And because of his ministry, uh, you just have to imagine what the Christians of Asia Minor are thinking. We were struggling before, and now our church father, our mentor, the one that we love, is in exile. What are we going to do? Where's the victory? And so into this whole mix of persecution, there's doubt and there's fear going on. And what happens is there's this circulation of apocalyptic literature that's going around. It's been around, it's been around in Jewish, a Jewish genre of writing for centuries. Uh, and what, what these writings would do, would they would make up fanciful stories in order to garner some hope. Because they're under impression, human government isn't going to do it. It's not going to deliver the Jews out of, uh, in, uh, with salvation. Something is going to have to happen that's divine. And so, so these writings popped up, but they did not carry the distinctives of the revelation of John. Because look in verse 1. Verse 1 tells us that he received it as a direct revelation from God. From God to Jesus to his servants, in particular, in first instance, to John through an angel and sometimes directly from Jesus to John. And when we get there in this series, it is absolutely breathtaking when you see it. And so what it reveals to his servants in verse 1 are the things that must soon take place. So these events must happen and they must happen soon. And immediately in verse 1 of, of Revelation, there's an interpretation issue here. The issue of soon. just want you to think about this for a minute. Imagine that you're in the church of, say, Ephesus in AD 96, and your pastor gets up and he reads out the, re the book of Revelation, because remember, this is, a, this is a letter. Revelation is a 22-chapter letter that was read out to a congregation as a letter. And so imagine your pastor reads this out and and, and he reads verse 1, and he said, these are the things that must soon take place. What would you think? You'd probably think, well, I better go and pack my bags. These, these things are happening soon. And a lot of early Christians thought this, thought this was the case. They thought that Christ, the fulfillment of all of this, would happen in their lifetime, or at least soon. And Jesus, you know, passages that are, that are used for this is Matthew 16, 24. There, there are some, he said, standing here who will not taste death until you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. But here we are 1,920 years later, and we're still waiting. It's not exactly soon. And so right here, right from verse 1 in the book of Revelation, is where diversions start happening in the interpretation of Revelation. I don't want to get bogged down in this, but I think one of the, things, one of the reasons why we avoid the book of Revelation, most of us read to chapter 5, and then afterwards we just go, uh-uh. Eh, eh. I'm not touching that, but, we actually, but it's, it's actually a shame. It's actually a shame. We, we need to read the whole thing, otherwise it wouldn't be in here. So, so we need to just quickly go through these four predominant views of how we might look at the book of Revelation. Firstly, you have the historical view. And the historical view would say that the contents, contents of the book have been unfolding throughout church history. So in chapters 2 and 3, you have the churches uh, in Asia Minor. And basically, the historical view would say, well, these, these churches are, his, are representative of church eras. So Martin Luther in the, the Reformation, he was the angel of Sardis. And then the, um, the, the missionary movement era that happened after that, well, that was the Philadelphian era, and now, you know, the church is kind of stuffed, so we're Laodicea. I don't, I don't like to be that pessimistic. I, I believe that God could do a revival again. And at the same time, it is actually only looking through Western eyes because it's like as if God only speaks to the West, and clearly he doesn't. 
from what we've heard this morning. But there is actually revival and there is gospel breaking out around the world. And so uh, what, what, what tends to happen is with the historical view is that it kind of gets lost, it kind of always has to fit the book into the sort of com- contemporary moment of history. And so, you know, when Hitler came, you know, he was the Antichrist, and, and then the Pope at the time was the false prophet, and then Mikhail Gorbachev, he was the Antichrist, and that black spot that he had on his head was the mark of the beast. And, and, and so time goes on, the historical view suffers from always having to fit into the historical moment of the day. But it works for them to say soon, because it is happening soon, it's happening now. So that's the historical view. Then there's the preterist view. And preterists say, no, the book wasn't written in the mid-90s. The book was written, written in the mid-60s AD. And so everything then was fulfilled in AD 70 with the Roman destruction of Jerusalem. And so basically, we're in the kingdom already. Jesus returned in some sort of judgment at that time, and so we're in the kingdom already. There's, there's a whole bunch of different views in this, full preterism and partial preterism, but that's basically the idea, is that Jesus returned in AD 70 and we're in the kingdom. The problem I have with that view, obviously, is that, that there is other textual evidence that, that goes against that, but also, look around. Is this the final victory? And so the word soon here works for them because they believe it all did happen soon, like written in AD 66, fulfilled in AD 70. So there's only four years. Then you have the idealist view, uh, which doesn't believe that the book here describes literal events, that it describes the spiritual struggle between good and evil. So, you know, this spiritual struggle that we all face between good and evil that goes on in our hearts and minds and in the world. And so basically, I guess, you know, there may be some people in this room who have that view, and welcome, that's okay. <laughs> um, but basically, this, this, uh, this view, uh, I think it suffers from not dealing with the de- detail of Revelation. Revelation has a lot of detailed stuff in it which, you know, describes what's going to take place, and this idealist view tends to just make it all point to one big idea, and that is the struggle between good and evil. So finally, you have the futurist view, and this views the book as forecasting future events yet to be fulfilled. Now, just turn over a page to verse 19 of chapter 1, and you'll see that the book actually has its own self-imposed structure. I don't know any other book in the Bible that has its own self-imposed structure, but this one does. And it says there in verse 19, it's a commission to John, the apostle, to write Therefore, the things that you have seen, that's the past, what you have seen, those that are, that's the present, and those that are to take place after this, that's the future. And so in Revelation, we have the past, present, and future, and you see this, chapter 1, verse 1 to 8, is his reflections on the past. Then 1, verse 9, until the end of chapter 3, you basically have the churches, so you have written in the the church age, the present, and then from chapter 4 onwards, you, you have... Everything after that is, is future events. So when we hit chapter four, we'll be talking about things in the future for the, from the futurist point of view. And so the way that the futurist view interprets the word soon is not that it could happen tomorrow, but rather that it, when it happens, it'll be quickly and it will, be, it will suddenly happen. So when these things happen, uh, uh, it'll, be, it'll, be, it'll be quick. And think about that. In the light of eternity, 1920 years actually isn't that long. And the Apostle Peter actually told us that with the Lord a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. And so our God is not bound by human time. Then within the futurist view, real quick, we have the a thousand years of peace that Christians like to fight about. And that is the millennium described in chapter 20 and we are going to talk about that but not today. So as you can see, this is where the divisiveness has happened in the wider church, and we can lose the forest for the trees. Even my professor at Liberty, who, who is a convinced pre-trib, pre-mill guy, he studied, studied it for 40 years, he had a TV show for 25 years and wrote stacks of books on it, he would say, he would say this almost every class. He would say, Revelation is not written to divide us, but to unite us. Not written to scare us, but to prepare us not written to frighten, but enlighten. 
And so I know that there will be some people here with different views, but that, that's normal. Uh, there's, you know, nowhere near any scholars would 100% agree on everything. But here is an important framework to help us, ad- to help us avoid divisiveness, because we're a family. And we might have different views, but we have to treat each other with love on them. And that's simply this. First of all, the fact. The fact is the second coming of Jesus Christ. Every denomination, except probably for for preterism, full preterism, and maybe Jehovah's Witnesses, believe in the second coming of Jesus Christ. Not many Christians will argue with that at all. Jesus is coming again. The King is coming. And... He will come in exalted glory. But then you come to the interpretations. Things like the rapture. So the belief that nothing else in history has to take place before Jesus returns in the clouds and takes up his church to meet him in the air. That's imminent. That's an interpretation. And that is the interpretation of City Reach Baptist Church. And I have heard some people say around the traps in the States and here, well, I don't believe in the rapture and left behind theology. That was all for the 80s and, you know, to get young people saved and baptized by scaring them. And I, I do understand that, but I would, I would put this caution is, is that you do have to put it somewhere. You do have to put the rapture somewhere. Look in places like 1 Thessalonians 4 verse 17. It, the word hapazo means to be caught up in the air, so it has to go somewhere. But it's up for interpretation where you put it. Is it prior to the tribulation? Is it mid-tribulation? Or is it at the end of the tribulation? These things are up for interpretation. So you have the facts, then you have the interpretation, and then finally you have the speculation. And that's like, okay, Barack Obama supported gay marriage, and so he's probably the antichrist. Or when the rapture happens, all our clothes are going to fall off, and, you know, uh, grandma's knee replacements are going to be on the floor, and grandpa's false teeth, and you can't take anything with you, and car crashes, and all these types of things that we kind of, you know, see on the internet. And the problem happens is when preachers and people who get obsessed with the book of Revelation, they preach the speculation and not the facts. Because what gets lost is what Revelation is all about. Remember, it was written into the context of suffering and it answers the question that we all have in our dark places and struggles. Where's the victory? That's what, it, that's what it answers. Where is the victory? Just real quick, I, we, we had a great time last year as a family, and we are always going to be thankful for the time, that the opportunity that we had to go to the States. And um, you guys sent us there, and so we'll be forever grateful for that. And what I decided to do when I first um, went, when, whenever you, I guess, do something big in your life, I think it's good to write start writing. And so I started the blog, and some of you might have started following uh, the blog I was writing. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to have some reflections on that for the future. And also, I wanted to stay in touch with you guys and, um, and also uh, give some spiritual encouragement, if I could. And uh, for any of you who are following with me on the blog, you would have noticed that about halfway through, it stopped. And um, People over there and here asked me in that time, so why'd you stop writing your blog? And um, it's, it's re- you know, really, I guess, a personal thing that I'll, I'll you know, be willing to share with you this morning is that um, pretty much for the last three months of the time that we were there, I had um, a dark spiritual d- depression. And I can't really explain it other than to say that pretty much when I woke up in the morning, I had the black cloud, and it followed me all through the day, and then I got to the end of the day, and uh, it's, you know, in the afternoon, and the dark starts coming down on the day, and I was just dreading the night, because uh, I knew that I'd be staring at the roof, and anxious, and out of breath, and uh, struggling. Couldn't, couldn't really work out and answer, give all the answers for why that was happening. 
But pretty much that happened every day, and uh, I had my wife sitting there trying to work out what was going on, and she couldn't work, work it out. And um, pretty much, I, as I think about it now, there's a combination of things. Um, I was exhausted from the, the workload, and I was homesick, and I didn't have anybody to talk, uh, talk to about it in a deep way. I had friends, but uh, it takes a time to develop spirit, you know, spiritual relationships. And, uh, and I had never been that low in my life. And um, I was also just suffering some condemnation and, uh, and some lack of obedience on some things that God had spoken to me about. And I, I got to a point, basically, where um, I, I, you, when you, I, I know that there'll be people in this room who know exactly what I'm saying. Probably right now, you have this black cloud, you can't even explain why. And... Um, I got to this point, some scary thinking on a whole bunch of things, and then I got to this point where I thought I was, I was coming back here to just tell you that it was like it was done. I couldn't do, I couldn't do it. I couldn't um, lead a campus. It couldn't be a pastor. It was done. I, I, was, I, I was in such a low position in my thinking. And, and at the same time, I'm putting guilt on myself. This isn't supposed to be like that. This... This is supposed to be going to America and doing this amazing thing. And uh, the one saving grace was, I did, I did share it with Timon. There's one person I did share it with. Uh, the one saving grace was that every week on a Tuesday or on a Thursday, I would go into Ed Heinsohn's Revelation class and I hugged every word because I needed it for my life. And my life was saying, where's the victory? In every, in, in every part of my life was saying, where is the victory? And I needed the words of revelation. I clung on to them for just some sort of hope. And I know that there will be people in this room who know exactly what I'm talking about, who are struggling through the exact same thing, and maybe you can't even explain it, or trials that you're going through. And so I wanted to share in these first eight verses what God has shown me about where the victory is. That the book of Revelation helps us to live victoriously in a state of expectancy, no matter the difficulty. Because it reveals where and how and why the, the victory is, where it is, why it is, all those things. The first thing is that the victory about the victory is that it was concealed but now it's been revealed look in verse 1 you see the words gave to show and made known in verse 2 what was previously hidden was now being revealed and John bore witness to what was being revealed which means that he knew that he was receiving a direct revelation from God. He, it was like the Old Testament prophet who stood up and said, thus says the Lord. This is what he was receiving. He knew it was scripture. And this is actually what God has been doing since the beginning of time. Think about it. Genesis 1 verse 1. God has been progressively revealing light into darkness. Darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. And then darkness reigned. And so, so much so that by the time of Noah, God had wiped out the face of the earth. Such was its evil with a worldwide flood. And then he raised up Abraham, who raised up Isaac, who bore Jacob. And the nation of Israel was birthed, whom God called to be a light to the nations. And yet darkness reigned again to the point of despair until God in his mercy saw it fit to send his son, Jesus, into the darkness, the light of the world. And it was the same disciple, John, here, who wrote in the opening words of the fourth gospel, the light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. And now, 
in Revelation 1 verse 1, at the very end, God shines again. He reveals more of himself to suffering Christians about how the end will come. He has not concealed it. He has revealed it. Praise God. Can you imagine if we didn't have Revelation He's not concealed it, he's revealed it. So we better not ignore it. You see, Revelation, it helps us to live victoriously in a state of expectancy, no matter the difficulty. Because God has always been revealing himself. And he is here making the end of the age known to anybody here right now who's willing to listen to it. Think about it in your heart right now. You're willing to... Are you willing to see the revelation of God? Are you willing to respond? He does not keep us in the dark. He turns the lights on of the future. And so as every one of us come to the book of Revelation, we should be asking ourselves this. What does God's unveiling of the future mean for how I should be living in this 90 minutes of time that I have? How should I be living? He's revealed it to me, so what do I do now? One of my favorite movies is Back to the Future. And in it, Marty McFly, he gets his hands on the sports almanac, which has all the sporting statistics in it ahead of time which he could use to play sure bets and make squillions, but the book was only going to be any good to Marty if he actually acted on it, if he actually did what it said. You, you might remember, remember Griff Tannen and how it sat on the back seat for a while. He just kind of ignored it until he discovered the power of it. So you see, he had a great deal of revelation at his fingertips, but... He wouldn't have gained a thing from it unless he actually obeyed it. And this is true for every one of us. While God has revealed to us how the end of the age will take place, which is an incredible amount of light to be shed in what would otherwise be darkness, it will only be any good to you if your hearing results in keeping. This is what verse 3 tells us. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. For the time is near. Now, here's the point. You can't experience the victory in this life if you don't obey God. It's impossible. And I I know that about my own spiritual depression. One of the causes of that was disobedience. I had something I needed to put right, and I didn't do it. I ignored it. See, if we really lived in light of all we know about the end, we would live differently. We'd be living victoriously because verse 3 says that there's a blessing on those who obey. And we'd actually be living expectantly because holiness is readiness. And this is our call, even in the tough stuff of life. John was put, was put into boiling oil and then he was exiled on Patmos, Patmos because he was a hearer and a keeper. Domitian wouldn't have cared about John if he wasn't a hearer and a keeper. He wouldn't have been a thorn in his side. But he was a hearer and a keeper. He obeyed God even in the most difficult of circumstances. And yet think on this. Think about this. This is amazing. John must have been in the absolute pits when he got exiled to Patmos. But guess who he unexpectedly saw there? He got to have an encounter with the one that he had not seen in 60 years. Can you imagine what that reunion would have been like? This is the unexpected blessing of your obedience. Every time I've done it. Every time God's spoken to me and said, step out in obedience, do it. Every time I've done it, I have experienced God in a new way. And Christ has actually changed me in that instant, in some way. This is what we are called to do, to not just be hearers, but to be keepers. And if we do, we will experience victory in this life. Now at verse 4, John begins his greeting to the churches. Remember, this is a 22-chapter letter. 
It's supposed to be read out to the congregation amongst their difficulties. And so John starts out by encouraging them with the best possible words you could ever say. Grace and peace to you. What's that? That's God's favor and the breaking down of his hostility towards you. What could be better than that? God's favor and the breaking down of his hostility. And look at the source of this grace and this peace. It's none other than the three persons of the Trinity. The Father who is and who was and who is to come. The seven spirits of God, which is just a name for the Holy Spirit. Seven uh, symbolizing perfection and completion. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the of kings of the earth. You imagine? Imagine how John's feeling about that after being under the oppression of Domitian. No, Jesus Christ is the ruler of kings of the earth. And the beautiful picture of this greeting is that as you here today face difficulty, and perhaps right now you even ask, where is the victory? You can know that the true source of grace and peace upon your life comes from none other than the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. God is your Father. He's your comforter, your helper. His compassions, they fail not. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And He indwells you by His Spirit so you can lift your weary head. He can speak life into your soul and He can even help you to turn your hearing into keeping. You are not cast out or excluded, even if you fail. Can you believe this? Look at this. John is having this reflection on the Trinity. The dizzying heights of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. One God, three persons. And he considers this relationship and thinks about the love that exists between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But that love was so great that he actually sent Jesus to die on the cross for you and for me. This is the love. And so what, what does John do? Look what he does. He breaks out in worship. This is what we all should do. He breaks out of worship to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom. What does that mean? Priest to his God, it means access. It means inclusion where we didn't have inclusion, where we were excluded, we're now included because of what Jesus has done. He's freed us from his sins because he loves us. Amen. See, the victory is that love has conquered death. And the daily experience of our life must be lived out in the grace and peace of God that was brought about by Jesus' shed blood. And so some of you here might have had the worst week in sin, and you may be living in the death of your sins. But today, because love has conquered death, you can actually cleanse your hands. You can cleanse your heart by coming to Jesus and putting it under the blood, laying it at the cross, and guess what? Jesus will forgive you. Some others are struggling with sins committed to you by others, and man, that hurts. It's almost too much to bear. And so know today who your source of grace and peace is. It's from your Father who indwells you by his Spirit on the basis of what Christ has done. And our response to today, all of us must be one of faith. You see, we're not living by sight. We're living by faith. We're not seeing Jesus in the flesh right now. This isn't the, the, the time that we are seeing Christ in the flesh right now. We are living right now by faith. This is our calling. This is what God asks of every one of you is just to express faith, to believe in him, to believe that he's real, to lay down your life for him, to turn from your sins and, and obey him. He asks for our faith. But one day, what is unseen will soon be seen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes and nations will wail on account of him. And this is the sobering reality of his coming. For you today who are a Christian, rejoice 
because you will see him and he'll take you to be with him and you'll be with him forever. And for those of you today who do not know if you have victory in Jesus, that is sobering. Representatives from every tribe and nation will wail on account of him. Not, not a sorrow that will lead to repentance. It'll be a sorrow of devastation that I'm just being judged. What a sorry and sad place to be. But there is hope. This, this sermon is not about casting judgment on anybody. This sermon is about telling you what Jesus has done in the gospel. That's what Revelation is about. Where's the victory? The victory is in Jesus. That's what Revelation, the book, is about. It's about Jesus. It's about nothing else. So where is the victory in this life? Well, Jesus is the one that God has revealed as your hope. He's the one who perfectly obeyed his father, And so he sets the example of how we might obey him as we read out Philippians. He's the one who conquered sin and death. He's the one who will soon be seen by all. And I just want to ask you, do you know that you have victory in Jesus? Are you asking in your life, where's the victory? 